supporting human conditions Not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians Cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign That's why you hear the same old things they claim Welcome to the Project Censored Radio Show I'm your co-host this week, Eleanor Goldfield Our understanding of every issue suffers without context And perhaps most glaringly today The issue of what's happening in Israel-Palestine in the first half of the show, Jackie Lookman joins the show again to contextualize Israel as a settler colonialist project and how that links to the pan-African internationalist struggle and why, once again, for the folks in the back, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Next up, your co-hosts Mickey Huff and I dig into some WikiLeaks files, some Reporters Without Borders reports, and the cracks in the facade of Israeli propaganda. All this and more coming up now on the Project Censored Radio Show. Thanks, everyone, for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad to welcome back to the show Jacqueline Lookman, who's a coordinator of the Mid-Atlantic region and member of the Coordinating Committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. Jackie, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. So I want to start, I'm actually pulling from a Liberation School article here from October 11th that writes, quote, the Black Panther Party was a supporter of the Palestinian struggle in his article on the Middle East. BPP co-founder Huey P. Newton stated, quote, we support the Palestinians just struggle for liberation 100 percent. We will go on doing this and we would like for all of the progressive people of the world to join our ranks in order to make a world in which all people can live. End quote. And so, Jackie, I wanted to ask you about this because one of the things that the U.S. is really good at is making us all goldfish and not remembering or really not learning in the first place our history. And I wanted to touch on how movements for liberation in the United States, particularly Black liberation, have always supported other movements for liberation around the world. And that includes, of course, Palestine. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that specific connection between those two movements? Yeah, I mean, this is a a long relationship in struggle against the same enemy, colonialism and imperialism. When we look at the article that Malcolm X wrote in an Egyptian newspaper called Zionist Logic in the 60s, he talked about that Zionism is colonialism. And he specifically says that Israeli Zionists are convinced they have successfully camouflaged their new kind of colonialism. Their colonialism appears to be more benevolent, more philanthropic, a system with which they rule simply by getting their potential victims to accept their friendly offers of economic aid and other tempting gifts that they dangle in front of the newly independent African nations whose economies are experiencing great difficulties. And then he goes on to say, the modern 20th century weapon of neo-imperialism is dollarism. The Zionists have mastered the science of dollarism, the ability to come posing as a friend and benefactor, bearing gifts and all other forms of economic aid and offers of technical assistance, Thus, the power and influence of Zionist Israel in many of the newly independent African nations has become even more unshakable than that of the 18th century European colonialists. And this new kind of Zionist colonialism differs only in form and method, but never in motive or objective. And this is Malcolm X saying all those decades ago that Zionism is, first of all, it's not only not a legitimate ideology, it is colonialism. It is colonialism. And I've been saying this over the past couple of days since October 7th has unfolded and people have taken to the streets in support of Palestine. I've started saying that Zionism is white supremacist settler colonialism with a star of David draped over it, you know, as a facade. And kind of forgetting that Malcolm X said the same thing, but in a lot greater detail 
Eleanor, you know, when we look at history and many of our revolutionaries, our revolutionary forefathers, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Kwame Ture, Amakar Cabral, so many of our forerunners who we get our strength and get our grounding in this struggle from correctly and honestly assessed the history of Palestine and the creation of Israel. And they understood even then in in the 60s, in the 50s, that Zionism is not Judaism. Zionism is a cynical, as, as I said, white supremacist, settler colonial ideology that is nothing but a cover for stealing the land of Palestinian people. And it's unfortunate. Well, actually, it's criminal and it's genocidal. What has happened is that people in this country in another white supremacist settler colonial project have been able to wholesale accept that Israel is surrounded by enemies and that the Palestinians hate them and want to kill them all. And all of the Arab nations surrounding Israel wants Israel to just not exist because they are Jewish. Not understanding that the opposition to the modern state of Israel is that it is a settler colony. It is a white supremacist settler colonial project and brings with it all of the ethnic cleansing and violence and genocide that settler colonial projects do by definition. So when we look at the history, the unfortunate thing that is missed, that is glossed over by these lies about Israel is innocent. The history that's missed is that Muslims throughout history were the ones who welcomed exiled Jews and exiled non-Orthodox Christians, by the way, who were repeatedly exiled or ethnically cleansed from that very same region by the Orthodox Christian rulers since before Constantine. But since we're talking about, you know, Christianity as a concept, we'll stick it at Constantine. So ever since Constantine decided to make Christianity the official religion of Rome, then the Roman empires repeatedly expelled Christians, non-Orthodox Christians, and Jews and Muslims from the territories they occupied. Palestine was one of those territories and that region repeatedly throughout the hundreds of years of history of Palestinian Christians, Muslims, and Jews living together in that region. Every time the Orthodox Christians came along, whether it was Constantine or the French with the Crusades, and either expelled all of the Muslims and Jews or killed everyone, as many as they could, Whenever a Muslim ruler came along after them, one of the first things they did was usually to welcome the exiled communities back into Jerusalem and Palestine proper. That has been proven throughout history. So unfortunately, because the Zionist Project has such great lobbyists and they have such a fantastic PR campaign, I think the Zionist entity has a PR apparatus that is second in efficacy only to the U.S. media. I don't see any other entity being able to prop up a lie as well and as long as the Zionists have in the way they have caricatured the Palestinian people, Muslims in general, and all of the Arab nations surrounding Palestine as if they're just singularly focused on destroying Israel because they're Jews and they just hate Jews. No, people hate settler colonialism. I'm not going to say that there are not some people who hate Jews. Of course there are. But the primary opposition of Palestinians, of people in the Arab world, and certainly of African people in the United States, in our opposition to Israel, 
it's the settler colonialism. It is the sterilization of women, of an undesirable population that Israel has done with Ethiopian Jews. These were Jewish people, but they sterilized the African Jews because, not because they're Jewish, but because they're African. And so we understand that is white supremacy. We talk about Palestine and we have been talking about them for years. And we always talk about Palestine in the context of people's struggle against oppression, occupation, colonization, and ethnic cleansing and genocide. That is a common theme and thread throughout all people's struggles. And, and certainly that's something that our history as a people, the history of indigenous people in this country and the history of African struggle definitely connects with, with our Palestinian cousins. And I definitely appreciate that connection to people, Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Palestine long before Jewish people started immigrating from fleeing the pogroms in the 1880s to Palestine not as Zionists, as Jews. And mm -hmm. so I think that that is, that is necessarily cut off from the discussion when Zionists give this argument, because that would fly in the face of their need to be. And I also appreciate you talking about how the system is malleable with regards to how it presents itself. And I wanted to ask you about that too, because one of the things that has been making the rounds on the interwebs is the video of a black IDF soldier. And there was a black Zionist on Instagram who was talking about how important she feels that Zionism is as a black Jewish person. And it reminds me, of course, of like Kamala Harris, this idea of how malleable the system is with regards to the people it can set forth as spokespersons for the system even though they are the marginalized groups. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how, how Zionism, just like other settler colonialist ideologies, used some of the most oppressed people to support their message. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's transactional. You know, you know it, it's, it's bad enough that any group of people thought it was a good idea to go to a whole other country and steal it from the people who were already there because they were fleeing oppression, which absolutely Jews needed a place, a safe haven from the horrific oppression and persecution that was going on in Europe. Absolutely, that's true. But instead of living in peace with people in Palestine, Zionists decided to come and take over everything. That's bad enough. When an oppressed people does that to another group of people, it's even worse when among that oppressed group of people, there is a subset of another group of oppressed people who are oppressed by the oppressors themselves because Black Jews, African Jews, as I pointed out, in the case of the Ethiopians, are subjected to racial discrimination in Israel because Israel is a white supremacist state. So just because they are in the IDF, the Israeli military, I'm not going to call them the defense because what are they defending? They're defending settler colonialism and that's not legitimate. But Black Jews who are serving in the Israeli military I look at it as a transactional kind of thing. It's like, I'll do this for you. I'll do your bidding if you don't discriminate against me so much. I, I think that's the easiest way because people, I think, have a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that African descended people can be white supremacists too. <laughs> you know, just like women can, can adhere to male chauvinism, you know, and sexism. Black people can be white supremacists. Black people can be settler colonists. You're listening to the Project Censored radio show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your co-host this week, Eleanor Goldfield. We now return to our conversation with Jackie Lookman. The black faces of Zionism that we're seeing on social media, they are put forth by this Zionist project to do two things, to say, see, Israel isn't white supremacist. We're not racist. 
black Jews? Look at that. And then, then to convince, to further convince black Americans, I hesitate to say that, but black people in America, that we should align ourselves with Zionist Israel, that our cause and that our affinity and solidarity should not be with the Palestinians. Because look, these crazy Arabs are attacking your black brothers and sisters over here in Israel. That's what this is. You know, I'm not going to say that the Israeli government has paid these people to do it. I think these people, just by virtue of the fact that they are there and they are, they have willingly decided to live in Israel, to be complicit in stealing land, the land of the Palestinian people and oppressing the Palestinian people, that makes them complicit. I've also been saying there's no such thing as an innocent settler. There's no such thing as as someone who is involved in the settler colonial project in any aspect who is innocent because settler colonialism, by definition, is a violent, genocidal process. So these black faces of Zionism are no different from the Kamala Harris's and the Congressional Black Caucuses, the Hakeem Jeffries in this country, the Lloyd Austin's the Susan Rices, who are the black faces of imperialism, warmongering, and bloodthirsty U.S. militarism all around the world. It's the same strain of ideology, and they're excellent propaganda tools. But I think they're willing excellent propaganda tools because, you know, the heat is taken off of them a little bit in exchange for their complicity in this. Right. It's similar to, you know, black cops in the United States. Well, they're not going to be the black person that's then killed by the cops because they are the cops. Right. So convenient. (laughs) And I wanted to ask, because I think this is a point that sometimes gets, I don't know if the word is gummy or sticky or whatever, but that there is no innocent settler. And I think this is a really interesting conversation because I am, as somebody who is not indigenous to the United States, I'm the child of immigrants. My mom came here in the 80s. My dad was first generation born in the United States. I am technically a settler in that sense. So I am also participating in the continued subjugation of indigenous peoples in the United States by living here. And how does that compare or contrast to what's going on in Israel? And how can we also talk about the defense of the Palestinian people vis-a-vis fighting back for their own survival? How can we talk about that while understanding that the settler colonial project is in and of itself a violence? How would you say that that compares to, for instance, me living here as somebody who's not of the indigenous population here? That's a really great question, because I think here is where we do get to talk about the history. When we talk about immigration in this country, it's always very political and, and, and it's always, you know, the, the kind of immigrants we do want and the kind of immigrants we don't want. And, and you know, do you, do you immigrate the right way or the wrong way? And the people leading this conversation, Eleanor, are always people whose ancestors literally stole this country, right? They are people whose ancestors came through Ellis Island with a barely legible piece of paper with no documentation outside of that. So it's an opportunity to bring up the illegitimacy of the conversation and the people who are controlling the conversation around immigration in this country in the first place. And I don't want people to mistake or or think that now is the time that we get to condemn people, you know, because you're all settlers. And no, that's not, that's neither entirely accurate but it's also not very helpful. It's not helpful in in advancing liberation. But this is the time. These are the kinds of conversations where we have a great and, and really unique opportunity to have these conversations connecting these issues of the indigenous people on this land, how they were disenfranchised by settler colonialism, how European immigration was seen and treated differently and how it still is compared to how immigration from other groups of people 
Haitians, Africans, Cubans, Venezuelans, Cubans and Venezuelans of, of a certain political persuasion, how they are used by the continuing settler colonial government of this country and the struggle for African liberations. Why do African radicals consider themselves African and not American? Why are we saying we're fighting for liberation in a country that we're supposed to be citizens of, right? Although people around the world have been rising up against colonialism and imperialism in some way, from Peru to Mali to Guinea-Bissau, you know, to Atlanta, to Baltimore with, you know, Cop City and, and all over the place, there is something different about this moment. I wish I could put a finger on what it is that's different. I don't know what it is that's different other than maybe for the only time since maybe Rwanda, the world is watching a genocide take place like on the evening news, right? And people are being forced to take a side, whether they're being personally confronted with doing that or not. And I think we should personally confront people about where they stand on this issue. And when they tell us they stand with Israel, then it's our responsibility to tell them you're wrong and this is why. So, so those conversations, everybody's not gonna agree. Everybody isn't gonna agree. A lot of people are still gonna stand with Israel because the propaganda has been so deep and so long and so effective. A lot of people will continue to believe that Israel is the victim and that Palestinians are the aggressors and the anti-Semites, although Palestinians are Semitic people themselves. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. But we're not going to be able to undo the indoctrination, the very effective and insidious Zionist indoctrination with one or two conversations. But if we can get a few people to respond like, okay, I understand. I didn't know that. If I can get from people, oh, I didn't know that. When I tell them about some of this history, that's a victory. That's getting people one step farther away from the propaganda and the lies and one step closer to joining the struggle for liberation. That's, that's how I look at it. And I think that's a beautiful way to look at it. And I, I love the idea of you got to meet people where they're at, right? Which is also why when I've been speaking to fellow Jews, I use a lot of Jewish teachings because our teachings are inherently anti-Zionist. They're inherently mm -hmm. anti-oppressive. <laughs> you know, like I was sending my dad rabbinical statements that were like anti-Zionist. Right. Use, use tools that speak to people. Like if somebody were to send me something trying to make a point that was made by like some radical queer Jewish person, and I'd be like, okay, I'm listening. You know, like right, I- Exactly. You gotta, yeah. And I, I feel like I could talk to you for days, which is always the case. But finally, in just a couple of minutes, I know that this is ridiculous, but I wanted to get in just one last question because I really appreciate the work that you do has so much of an internationalist perspective and pan-Africanism, which- I've learned a lot about from you and, and folks like Netva Friedman. How can we take a page from that book in terms of screw borders? The powers that be don't care. And so liberation must be collective. How, how can we take that perspective on what's happening now so as to link it to all of the struggles that we are facing collectively? Well, when you look at, in just a material sense, when we look at the Israeli military. We understand it for people who didn't know that there are lots of police departments in the United States that go to Israel and are trained by the Israeli military. And they train them in these repressive, violent techniques that the Israeli military uses against Palestinians that the U.S. police forces come back here and use on us. This is absolutely true of the Metropolitan Police Department here in Washington, D.C., and the homeless population is exploding because people cannot afford to live in this city. And this is true across the country. 
city councils, mayors, lots of democratic city councils and mayors are always voting to increase funding for police to continue to prop up the 1033 program that takes surplus military equipment from the Pentagon that gives them to local police departments to use against us on the streets. People fighting against this repression, people fighting against racist police terrorism, these people fighting against the proliferation of cop cities. So that's the connection with Palestine there. And Palestinians have, when George Floyd was publicly lynched, Palestinians rose up in support of George Floyd and Black lives snuffed out by racist police terrorism. In the 2020 uprisings, it was Palestinians who reached out to Black folks in the streets to help us learn how to mitigate tear gas, the effects of tear gas while we're out protesting. Tear gas that is provided to the Israeli military by the United States government. And the same United States military that is giving weapons and training and all of this lethal material support to the Zionist government in Israel is the same government that props up AFRICOM to militarize Africa and suppress populations of people rising up against neocolonialism and imperialism there. This is the same militarism that is backing a coup government in Peru, Indina Buarte. This is the same settler colonial government, the U.S. government, and its militarism that is ratcheting up a war against China over Taiwan, which is a part of China. And this is the same U.S. government that started the proxy war using Ukraine against Russia and then turned around and demonized everyone in the U.S. that told the truth about this being a proxy war in Ukraine started by the U.S., the EU, and NATO. So the same settler colonial white supremacist government in this country exports its ideology, its capitalist oppression, its militarism, and its just crushing of people's movements all around the world. That's the international connection. We're not just fighting against one government. We're fighting against the head of the snake, Eleanor. And the head of the snake is the United Snakes government. That's the internationalism that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. and Ella Baker and Amilcar Cabral and Thomas Sankara and Samora Michelle and Maurice Bishop, that is the internationalism that we continue our struggle founded on. You are listening to the Project Censored Radio Show on Pacifica Radio. We'll continue our program after this brief musical break. So please stay with us.
You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, with co-host Eleanor Goldfield. And in this segment, we're going to revisit one of our salon-like sessions where Eleanor and I talk about key issues happening around the world through a critical media literacy lens. We talk about media coverage. We talk about censorship and its many guises. We deconstruct numerous propaganda campaigns that are basically unending and seemingly around a few different topics they never end. War and peace is one of those big topics where we see that challenge routinely, unfortunately. Eleanor, we're seeing such extraordinary reaction for these attacks from Hamas that we're even seeing APAC people like Wolf Blitzer over at CNN show empathy and sympathy for civilian deaths in Palestine, but there's a number of things that I know that you want to talk about and that you've been talking about on your other platforms. And I'm glad that we're going to be able to do it today and we can do it for the Project Censored audience. So Eleanor, let's just get started. There's a lot to unpack here in that regard. What's um, one of the things you want to talk about first? Yeah. So Mickey, I, I I do want to start off by saying that, yes, there are cracks in the facade of the Israeli propaganda machine. And I think that that speaks to a lot of things, and one of them being the power of the people to shift this narrative. And lest we forget, this is not this did not start on October seventh, right? <laughs> this started somewhat before nineteen forty eight, and so people have been trying since then to shift the narrative to Israel has a right to defend itself, to be a home for all Jews, particularly the whitest ones. Lest we forget that Israel has a habit of doing things like forcibly sterilizing Black Jews. So the idea that it's a home for all Jews is in and of itself incorrect. So I do want to say that, yes, the facade is cracking, and you have people like Wolf Blitzer, who used to work for APAC, pushing a little bit against an IDF spokesperson who was on his show and saying, but you did know that you were bombing a refugee camp that was filled with women and children. You knew that, right? And the IDF spokesperson kind of dances around the question, and then Wolf pushes him again. And this is something that you never would have seen from the likes of Wolf Blitzer just uh, you know a month ago or something. So I do want to highlight that that is happening. But at the same time, Truth Out recently reported, the mm-hmm. Biden administration has requested that arms deals with Israel be done in complete secrecy because they know that public opinion is against them. So the system is trying to ensure the perpetuation of support for Israel as an apartheid and now genocidal state can continue, but on the down low, while public opinion continues to shift. So I think it's important to recognize that both of those things are true at the same time. And with that, I wanted to highlight another important Mm -hmm. connection that we have here, already back in 2007, for instance, and and folks can follow WikiLeaks on Twitter and on Instagram, and they've been posting images of these cables, for instance, like uh, this one from Israeli Defense Intelligence Chief in 2007, quote, Israel would be happy if Hamas took over Gaza because IDF could then deal with Gaza as a hostile state, end quote. I mean, this also lines up with reports that we've been seeing that Netanyahu wanted the attacks on Israeli citizens to happen on October 7th, because it would give him the ability to to move ahead with this. And we we see similar cables back in 2008, for instance, U.S. officials were told by Israel that Israel wanted to keep Gaza's economy, quote, on the brink of collapse, while at the same time just barely avoiding a humanitarian crisis, which is, of course, what they've absolutely done. And although I wouldn't say they've been avoiding a humanitarian crisis, So these are cables that WikiLeaks has shared with us over the years that allows people to see behind that very facade that we see cracking more and more now, Mickey. And Eleanor, we've seen other leaked documents suggesting historically that part of the plan around the attacks was to create a forced relocation or to push the Palestinian population into Egypt or somewhere. I mean... The whole way the corporate media has been reporting, and we're reporting this, you know, the idea that the Israeli government was warning Gazans to leave, where are they going to go? 
I mean, again, this has pejoratively been re- referred to as the largest open air prison in the world. You know, Abby Martin's film, Gaza Fights for Freedom, shows that Menar Adlai and Mint Press have done many documentary video footage around this. We've seen it over and over and over again. What's missing in the Western press often is that historical context, just like what's often missing is agency. When we see reports, Eleanor, of Israelis dying, there's always somebody doing the killing and doing the atrocities. When we see Palestinian civilians, well, actually, we don't usually get to see civilians because they don't usually cover the Palestinian deaths. But now it's happening so openly and wantonly, it's impossible not to discuss or cover it. There doesn't seem to ever be anybody pulling the trigger or dropping the bomb when Palestinians die. It's just a passive language. And, you know, if you're not following Alan McLeod's work from Mint Press News on Instagram or other places, I'd recommend that, too. He does like a real time deconstruction of headlines, you know, where, where he's talking about the current Palestinian migration. Like the New York Times is acting like this is a migration as if like people are picking up and saying like, it's time to go do something else. When it's people are just being murdered in cold blood. Eleanor, you know, just a couple of those things with the media analysis. I mean, they're patently absurd yet normalized. Absolutely, Mickey. And I think this also speaks to the critical media literacy that Project Censor does which is being able to read a headline and questioning, okay, but how did they die? And why are you phrasing it that way? And one of my favorites that Alan McLeod, I don't know how he finds all of these, to be honest. One of my favorites that he shared was on October 14th. It's a Reuters headline. And it reads, quote, Reuters journalist killed in Lebanon in missile fire from direction of Israel. It's pretty extraordinary. The twisting, the turning, Again, I mean, we could sit here and read the things that Alan has collected all all day long. And look, there's atrocities abounding here. That's another unfortunate reality, which is why there's been record numbers of people protesting, calling for a ceasefire. We had over a quarter million people in Washington, D.C. There are people all over the world, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., London, Paris, And another thing that we see happening is the corporate media, like they always do, they grossly undercount the number of people. It's almost as if Donald Trump's inauguration bean counters are in charge in the opposite way. Somehow they either overcount one thing or or undercount another, depending on the topic. And we've got over a quarter million people in Washington, D.C., yet at the Washington Post, it's some people came out to protest on Sunday afternoon after brunch. Or, or in San Francisco, there's record numbers of people. They, they're like thousands of people in March. Look, I remember this 20 years ago with Iraq. There were a quarter million people in the streets of San Francisco, and they said 10,000 people showed up to talk about something bad. This is just another part of the propaganda. Just to remind people that this is Monday, November 6th, that you and I are talking, and we're pre-recording this. So when people hear us next week and complain about all the things we didn't accurately predict, they can remember this. But Eleanor, what do you want to say about that issue? Again, it's back to framing. The corporate media, there are cracks in that facade. Piers Morgan, even, you know, one of the staunchest cheerleaders for, you know, the permanent war state, even Morgan has had to reluctantly admit that this coverage is biased and these things are problematic. What else can you say about this, Eleanor? I know that you are out and about witnessing firsthand how many people are at these protests. What can you say to that? Yeah, Mickey, I mean, I I too remember the Iraq war and and remember coming home from protests and being like, there were way more people. But this is classic. And this is also why frontline journalism is so important. And I'd like to take this moment to also point out that there are people inside of Gaza that are still reporting so that we can have information, so that we can actually know what is going on. And those people are the real journalists. Those people are the real heroes, to be perfectly honest. And again, like going back to how this is framed, yes, we can, you know, I don't even want to throw them a bone, but you could say like, oh, thanks, Wolf, for actually like doing something quasi-journalistic for once. But he still allowed the IDF spokesperson to say, well, that's where Hamas was hiding. And it's unfortunate that they hide in refugee camps. Why would you let him get away with that? 
But of course, that is important for people to walk away from that broadcast thinking, well, that IDF spokesperson didn't really have it all together. But what is he going to do? Hamas is hiding amongst babies. So what are we going to do? We have to bomb the babies. It's that kind of like, what is the takeaway there? And so the takeaway from corporate media, I think, still is largely, okay, but Israel still has to defend itself. And this continues even though even the UN has been unwilling to say Israel has killed UN officials. They just are like, unfortunately, what is it now? It's like it's dozens of UN officials have died, have died, have been killed. How? What what happened? They all get the flu? Like, what's going on? Yeah. Again, it's the passive voice. And look... Again, I'm going to remind listeners that you and I are talking on Monday, November 6th. This program doesn't air until the following week. But we have reports. We're talking about at least 10,000 deaths in Gaza. We're looking at 18 heads of 18 United Nations agencies and NGOs issued a joint statement calling for ceasefire. Again, expressing complete horror that this has to stop. It's been a month. A quote from that statement is, quote, we need an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It's been 30 days. Enough is enough. We must stop now, unquote. So we are seeing more and more people coming out and saying what's happening here is is a, a gross violation of international law. But it's curious, too, and I want to go back to Alan McLeod, because one of the things that he does as a media scholar, and again, I think that that's something that needs to really be specifically and purposely inserted into this conversation, critical media literacy, when you take a look at the press, the Western press in particular, it's a steady drumbeat of propaganda. McLeod went on to talk about why Israel must fight on. He talks about how Biden is warning that the arms deals with Israel need to be done in total secrecy. He's talking about, here's another thing that they are covering and, and things that they are saying. There was another article by Andrew Roberts, an historian, that said, for a better tomorrow, Palestinians need to forget historical grievances. Well, isn't the whole argument behind what's happening with Israel an historical grievance? When you go and look at media scholarship and you look at the people that are attuned to media propaganda and you look what they have to say about these kinds of news developments, I think that they should be side by side with foreign policy experts, policy analysts, etc., because without understanding the function of media, we don't understand the control around the narratives, the messaging, and what's newsworthy and what isn't, who's a worthy victim, who's an unworthy victim. We've talked about this at length on this program, Eleanor, and we're seeing much more of it. We're seeing more and more coverage that, despite the fact that there are cracks in the facade, the overwhelming majority of reports coming from the West are downplaying what's happening and continuing to lend credibility that in many cases mirror Zionist propaganda. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, Mickey. And it's uh, the U.S. Is, is the primary bankroller for the apartheid state of Israel. So it's not surprising to see that. And when you were talking, I, I was reminded also of other euphemistic language. For instance, people are calling for a ceasefire, which means that you just stop. Right. Like technically, we have a ceasefire with North Korea. So ceasefires can obviously last quite a while. And that's why it's so important to call for one. But what other officials in the U.S. have been calling for and what apparently the Biden administration called Israel and asked for was a humanitarian pause. What, what is that? What does that mean? That is absolutely absurd euphemistic language to suggest that you're doing something that is humanitarian when in reality, Humanitarian pause is, is, is purposely vague enough so that you don't have to do anything outside of what you were already doing, but you get to put a stamp on it that says we did the right thing, we did the good thing. And even that Israel wasn't willing to accept. Even that they were like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. And of course, then the Biden administration gets to go, well, we tried. When of course, in reality, if the US actually wanted to push Israel on something, they could really throw that leverage behind it, hold it being the ones who hold the purse strings. And you know, let, let's just say that even, even on one single issue, let's say the issue of journalists and free speech and free press, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Biden talked about how important it is to have free press and da 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 da. Okay, Joe, if you really care about that, how about the recent Reporters Without Borders report that showed 
that since October 7th, at least 31 journalists have been killed. 26 Palestinian, four Israeli, and one Lebanese. You're listening to the Project Censored radio show on Pacifica Radio. We'll now continue the conversation between Mickey Huff and I, your co-hosts. And this investigation by Reporters Without Borders found that these groups of journalists were targeted by Israeli forces. And they say, quote, two strikes in the same place in such a short span of time, just over 30 seconds with regards to this one reporter, Abdullah, from the same direction clearly indicate precise targeting. So Israel is targeting. They are going after journalists. And just like we saw with the Great March of Return, they are going after press, but they're also going after vulnerable people. That includes children, that includes elderly, because these people are oftentimes the adhesive, the glue of community. The children being the future of a culture and the elders being the the memory keepers, the memory holders. A lot of these elders who were at the Great March of Return were even marching with the keys that they had from the homes that they were forced out of in 1948. So the IDF go after the most vulnerable and important parts of a community. They, they've done this since the beginning. They, they have become really, really good at this. Shooting the messenger. This is how you try to ensure that your propaganda, that your story is the one that is plastered all over global news and not the story of the people who are there living it and who can say, I saw them bomb the hospital. I'm standing next to it. They don't want those stories to get out. So it's vital to target these journalists. And so we're seeing that in real time. And those that are still alive and able to get the messages out have been vital in perpetuating the truth that Israeli forces have and will continue to shoot the messenger here. So Eleanor Goldfield, I wanted to, to read a quick quote since you've been, and we've been talking about Reporters Without Borders, rsf.org. I know some people may say, how does that, uh, how does that translate? Well, it, it translates from French, Reporters Without Borders, or Sans Frontiers, rsf.org. And I wanted to read a statement very quickly from RSF Secretary General, just to give some context here. Since 2000, RSF has not seen a war begin with so much violence against journalists. Israel's attack on Gaza in response to the massacre committed by Hamas will go down in the history books and in the annals of journalism as one of the cruelest episodes for reporters as well as all other civilians. The Israeli government should realize the horror does not justify horror. The state of Israel will have to take responsibility before history for the deaths of journalists on a scale unknown in the 21st century. RSF, Reporters Without Borders, call on the Israeli authorities to end the bombardments which amount to war crimes. This disastrous toll adds a new blood-colored stain to an already tragic story. More journalists have been killed in the course of their work in two weeks in the Middle East than in Ukraine since February 2022 as a result of the Russian invasion. This is the sad reality of a grim toll. So we're talking about record numbers of reporters being killed, Eleanor. Yeah, absolutely, Mickey. And with the, with that, I think it's important to note that I can't recall the exact number, but the UN had estimated that roughly 9,100 9, people have died in the war in Ukraine since it began. And we're already over 10,000 people in Gaza who have been murdered. Just to give people an idea of what we're looking at, in terms of the amount of time that this this specific bombardment has been happening and the loss of life is astronomical. And again, this, of course, speaks to the importance of journalists, of getting the story out there. And this is also, Mickey, why I think it's so important to have not only critical media literacy, but the access to it. And, you know, we've seen even before October 7th, you know, if I if I posted a video or something that said like Israel and Palestine in it or something, I get like two views or something. And I know that this is the case with a lot of folks. And, you know, we look at places like Mint Press News that have been absolutely tarred and feathered by the powers that be because they so frequently talk and have talked about what's happening in Palestine and specifically Gaza for years. And this is that that kind of the covert aspect of, you know, you're not shooting a journalist, you're not jailing somebody, but you're shadow banning them. You're yeah. ensuring 
that those stories don't reach people. So that when somebody outside of my filter bubble, like most of the U.S., goes and types in on, on the Google, what's happening in, in Israel? Are they going to see the reporting from Mint Press News first? Are they going to see Abby Martin's film first? Are they going yeah. to see Alan McLeod? They're not going to see these stories first. And of course, that is, that's absolutely by design. Yeah, it's it's by design. And, you know, I also want to point out Reporters Without Borders talks about how this is the deadliest year in Israel-Palestine since 2000. A decade ago, there were nine journalists that were killed there. To show how far it's gone since October 7, several people from Palestine today, the channel director, a photojournalist and co-founder of another press agency, they were killed. They were targeted and killed at attacks on their homes. So this isn't, this isn't even just like how we blew up Al Jazeera in the Iraq war. This is actually going after journalists at their homes, killing their families. And I wanted to bring up, I just wanted to bring up one more thing, Eleanor, in the few minutes we had left for this segment, because maybe we should have brought it up first, but better late than never. The criticism of the IDF, of the Netanyahu policies, his party, the right wing of the Israeli government, is in no way an an anti-Semitic critique. I'm not saying there aren't aren't anti-Semites out there. I'm not saying that there aren't people that use this opportunistically to advance racism against Israel, which is flat out wrong and disgusting. But criticism of Israeli policy, IDF policy, warfare as it's conducted, is not at all anti-Semitic. And so I wanted to put that out there again because I know some people out there are going to say this show was biased. We only covered these attacks. But again, let's remember it's the Project Censored show. There's no shortage of coverage of Hamas atrocity. There's no shortage of hearing the Israeli IDF, Israeli government, Netanyahu perspective in the media in the West. There's no shortage of it. What there's a paucity of has been is the kind of coverage that we're offering today the perspective that we're offering that has been so lacking. And so the people listening to our program, thank you for listening to our program. But also we appreciate constructive critiques, but let's also remember that this program is trying to fill a really large hole of what the established media don't seem to get around to covering. And even when they do, they don't do nearly an exhaustive job covering it as Electronic Intifada, Mint Press News, we can go on and on. So Eleanor Goldfield, last couple minutes here, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that tired trope of people who get accused on the left in particular of being anti-Semitic in their criticism of Israel, and wanted to remind people that leftist critics do not necessarily mirror other critics, in this case, against the Israeli war in Gaza. Yeah, I mean, and I think that th this this also speaks to the issue of critical media literacy and the trouble with the binary. The truth is that multiple things can be true at once. And here's that truth. We can and must absolutely fight and struggle against the apartheid state of Israel. And we must fight against anti-Semitism, which, by the way, just to, to, to nerd out for a second, Palestinians are Semites as well. There's that little thing. But as someone who is Jewish, I can tell you that it is not anti-Jewish to be against the state of Israel. It is actually anti-Jewish to be for the state of Israel. And I'll just take one minute to explain why. To suggest that Jews only belong in one place is in of itself anti-Semitic, because you are saying that we are not welcome everywhere. And just think about how that has related to other groups of people throughout history, right? The idea is that people should be at home wherever they are. And there has actually been a long history since Zionism started in the late 1800s as a movement, as a colonial movement, there has been an equal pushback from Jewish communities saying, no, we are at home wherever we are. And I don't want to go to Israel, this, you know, fairy tale land of Israel. I'm not from there. And I recommend that people check out Shlomo Sand's book, The Invention of the Jewish People, really fascinating perspective into that history. But I do just want to basically wrap up here by saying, yeah, we'll never cover everything that the corporate media isn't covering. It's impossible. I could spend the rest of my life and still at the end of it be like, I got through 15 minutes of what should have been covered on CNN. It's impossible. Eleanor, that's well put. And 
it's really important, I think, to reiterate what's happening. The loss of life is, period, a horrendous tragedy. And that can't be forgotten. I think really focusing on media coverage and, and, and asking people to expand or broaden their media diet, so to speak, around this is really important and really significant, especially living in places like the U.S. Would also like to remind our listeners that you can go for free to projectcensored.org. Andy Lee Roth, our associate director, has an article making sense of the establishment news media's distorted coverage of Gaza. We have links to 20 years of censored and underreported stories. Robin Anderson, media scholar, did a whole article on big media facilitating Israeli war crimes. Again, looking for those other perspectives. You can go to projectcensored.org for free to see those. And of course, as ever, Eleanor Goldfield and I will be here at the Project Censored show talking about the news that doesn't make the news while analyzing why week after week. And we want to thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time. We want to smash, crash, smash, smash, blast the system. We want to get it I get it live. Get with the mission. We want the crowd loud. This pump and rhythm is hitting. We want and that does it for another episode of the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, co-hosting with Mickey Huff. For this episode, I've also been your associate producer, and Anthony Fest is our senior producer. Project Censored Radio airs on roughly 50 stations across the U.S., from Maui to New York. And you can find all our previous archived programs by going to projectcensored.org. Please follow and like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram just before we get deplatformed. And be sure to subscribe to the official Project Censored show on your digital tethering devices podcast application. Please feel free to contact us, share your feedback, or learn more about our work at projectcensored.org and see our new publishing imprint, The Censored Press, at censoredpress.org. To learn more about my work or to contact me specifically, please visit my website at artkillingapathy.com. You can also follow me on social media at Radical Eleanor. Last but not least, thank you so much to our listeners for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Political ties, habitual lies, alibis, skies, and other guys, democracy, politics, and the apocalypse. Got the skies like an ominous. So the ocean burn bright with waves full of poison. Genocide, wars, fall for little poison. The weapons manufactured pay for why. Tax them all the bridges and the levees and the mines collapsing. All the prisons, build the capacity, citizens. And the times for the master thief. Combine and conquer, steal a masterpiece. Open your eyes and realize what's happening. Time's running out to reach all potential. Fiend at the table, then you're probably on the menu. We got that love. educator and activist Penny Rosenwasser. Sure, I have inherited Jewish trauma from 2,000 years of the killing of Jews, the, the Holocaust, which killed one out of every three Jews in the world at the time. The pogroms, the crusades, the inquisition. I, I grew up with a lot of worry, but it's trying to work through that. A colleague of mine said, we have to choose justice despite our fears. We have to face our fears and not act on them. And actually that choosing justice despite our fears, I got from Irina Klepvich, a wonderful Jewish activist, lesbian feminist, teaches at Barnard. She teaches Jewish studies and she teaches Yiddish studies. And she escaped the Warsaw Ghetto with her mother when she was four years old. And her father was a leader of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and was killed. And Irina's the one who says, we have to choose justice. Of course, our fears are legitimate and we have to just keep choosing justice despite our fears. Storytelling for Social Change on KPFA. Our fund drives at KPFA are not just a request for your financial support. It's a call to action to ensure that 94.1 FM remains a beacon of hope, enlightenment, and activism. Your donation, no matter the size, is a vote of confidence in the power of independent, listener-supported radio. It's a declaration that you stand with us in our mission to inform, inspire, and incite change. Thanks again for your generous support, and keep listening to KPFA. 
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FC in Monterey, and always online at kpfa.org. 